Last week, we talked about more of like a, the foundational like character or message of John. A lot of us know him for it. The theme last, year, or last week we talked about was humility. And uh, a lot of us know John for that, that iconic statement, he must increase and we must decrease. We studied that. But today, um, we're going to close out the series with another kind of like a hallmark message of, of John because we've studied more of the internal characteristics and John's design and his uniqueness and even his character of humility and things like that. But today, it's, it's probably another hallmark of John, which is his mission, uh, John's, John's mission. And, and he was the very first missionary for Jesus. He was the very first witness. And we've kind of talked about how John the Baptist, in a lot of ways, was a model for us. He modeled what it meant to be filled with the Holy Spirit, what that looked like. He modeled what it meant to proclaim Jesus and to be a witness and a missionary for Jesus, in which we take up the baton now after John leaves the picture. And so the title of today's uh, message is, is John's Mission, My Mission, because what John modeled for us is now up to us. Can I get an amen, you guys? That God has called us to be missionaries for him and witnesses for him. And I believe that among all the topics, we might not like this topic very much. Um, even if you're a lover of Jesus, this topic of, of being a witness and a missionary is not your favorite topic probably, but I, I, I guarantee this, this is probably one of the most important topics to God. This is, you know why? Because, and I hope this doesn't rub you the wrong way, but God is more concerned about those who um, are on the outside than those who are on the inside. I hope that doesn't rub you the wrong way, but God, God is more concerned about outsiders than he is about insiders. He's more concerned about the lost than he is the found. And if you don't believe me, you need to go read Luke chapter 15. In there, Jesus tells three different stories of the lost things. And he, and he says that God is, is so more interested and consumed with the lost sheep that he actually leaves the 99 for the one. And that he is more concerned looking for the lost coin. He doesn't, he doesn't care about the found ones. And, he's, and his heart is concerned about the lost son, not the son that is found. That God is, look, God is distracted. Like by, it has hit, the lost things has God's heart. And if you've ever lost anything of value, you would agree that you are distracted by the things that you lose that are of value. Like if you ever lose your wallet, you're not going, well, well, at least I got a couch. I got a couch. I'm good with it. No, you're, you are thinking about your wallet. That's all you're, you are consumed in thinking about. You're distracted by the lost things. And if you've attended our membership class here at Discovery called Step One, uh, you've, you've heard me tell, tell probably one of the most passionate stories that I know about the lost things where my wife and I lost our middle daughter, our middle child, in the mall. And so if you've attended the, the class, I've, I've told this, I'll kind of rehash it a little bit today, but I think God, God allowed me to experience this um, firsthand because I think, I think he allowed it because he wanted me to know the heart of the Father for the lost things. And, and so um, if you attend the membership class, I'll tell it in, in more, more detail, but uh, you know, we lost my, my, my middle child, in Abigail, in the mall. And not, not, not at one moment during that, you know, her being lost, did I think to myself, well, at least I got two out of the three. That ain't bad. <laughs> I was not thinking about the found ones at all. I was so consumed with the loss. That's all, that's all I was concerned about. I didn't care about the, honestly, I didn't care, I didn't think about the found. And if they were to come up to me and, and ask me for something like that, I, I, would, I didn't con I had no concern what your wants are or your desires are. If they were to come up to me during the search party for Abigail and go, Dad, what are we having for dinner? And what is, can I get this, Dad? I want that. I'd be like, get out of here. I don't, I'm not talking to you about that right now because I got my loss. Girl, either join the search party or get out of the way. See, this is a big value to God. And I, 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 we did find her. We did find her. And if you want to hear the story more, <laughs> come, to, come to step one. But this was John's mission. John, John lived in such a way. He was just so consumed with his purpose where, where a lot of us, and they all begin, your feelings all begin with P. And I'm going to give you some, some different, you know, words that maybe as well that begin with P. Because a lot of us, we live our life um, protecting what is ours, trying to get promoted to our, to our status, or projecting something we're not. We're, we're too busy protecting, projecting, and promoting. And John the Baptist, again, shows us he is a model for us on how to be a missionary for Jesus. Can I hear an amen, lovers of Jesus? Okay, here's, John's, here's John's, John's mission. This is what he did. Number one, write some notes, you guys. He prepared the way. 
That's what John did. He was sent to prepare the way for Jesus. So here's the question for those of you that love Jesus today. The people that are in your life, are they more prepared to meet Jesus because of your interaction with them? Are they more prepared because of, because of your influence in their life, your friendship, that you're their coworker, that you're in that family? Or are they more prepared to meet Jesus because you are influencing or in their life? John chapter 1, we're going to follow John chapter 1 a little bit here. John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of the one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. John's whole mission that he lived consumed with his purpose. He said, I am here. It's not about me. I'm not trying to pr project something that I'm not. I'm not trying to protect or promote anything. I am here to prepare the way, the truth, and the life. Here's the second thing John did as part of his mission. John proclaimed the way. He proclaimed the way. So, so he, he, wasn't, he wasn't concerned about his status or his image. He proclaimed with his words. I wonder what our words are saying, what direction our words are pointing. Like what, what direction, where, if people were just, to, if I was to follow you around and listen to the words that you're saying to your kids or your spouse or in your work, and what, I wonder if, it was, if your words are proclaiming. What are your words proclaiming today? Lovers of Jesus. What are, John says, you know what, I, I am sent here to proclaim the way to Jesus. He told the religious leaders that I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one that you don't know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I'm not even worthy to untie. He's, I'm not trying to promote myself. I'm not going to project a false image of myself either. I'm just, I'm going to proclaim the way to Jesus. Here's the last. John, John also pointed the way. He, he not only um, prepared the way, he proclaimed the way, and John took every opportunity he could to point the way. And, I, and listen, your life, our life, is pointing a way. Hey, today your life is pointing. I wonder, like, when people ask for advice to you, or, or you give them some, some, some advice, or, 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 or you're, in, in your interactions, I, I wonder where you point them. Do you point them to self-help? Do you point them to, to, where are you pointing people? Look, John, John modeled for us like so consumed with his mission that, that I am here to prepare the way, proclaim the way, and at every, at every moment I can, I'm going to point people to the way, the truth, and the life. John 1, 29, it says, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, hey, look, there he is. Look, look, look. I'm just going to take every opportunity. There he is again. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And right after John baptizes, just after, shortly after this, John baptizes Jesus. Jesus gets up out of the water, and you guys know he's led into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. He overcomes the temptation of Satan by the word of God. But right after that, he comes out of the wilderness, and what John does is starts to recruit new missionaries. He starts to recruit new witnesses because John's man, John was just a bridge. He's, he was just a model for us. And he goes and he, and he goes and tells Peter, hey, come on, Peter, come follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. I need some new witnesses. I need some new missionaries because John was just a bridge. It was just a moment. But I need some people. And at the end of Jesus' life, he would say, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. This is a big deal to God, church. And it might not be something that we think about as often as we probably should, but I promise you of all the messages I probably preach and teach you guys, this one here is God's heart. This is God's heart. God loves people. And he's looking for missionaries to prepare the way, proclaim the way, and point to the way. And I want to help us do that today. I want to, I want to help us become effective witnesses that John's mission can become our mission, and I know it's an, an uncomfortable topic talking about this for a lot of us. Like, I, like some of you would go, Pastor, you don't want me talking to, to anybody about the Bible and about Jesus, because if I get in a debate with someone about they, what they believe and what I believe, I'm going to lose that debate, so I just don't have it. That's, so listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you today how easy it truly is. I think people make it way too hard, and what you probably think it is, it isn't. And what you're trying to share most likely is not what God wants you to share. So I'm going to show you today how simple it is and how easy. And if you're nervous about it, I want to show you today it's easier than you think, and it's not what you think. And the thing that you're aiming at sharing is probably the wrong thing to share. Let me show you this verse. 1 Peter chapter 2 says this. 
but you are. Say that out loud. One, two, three. You are. are. That's not just preachers and pastors and and just, no, no, no. You are, the Bible says, the ones chosen by God. Chosen for the high calling of priestly work. You know, God has called you a priest. That God has called you a witness, a missionary, an ambassador, a priest. Chosen to be his holy people. For what? What? Well, to be God's instruments to do his work and to speak out for him. That's what God has called you to do. He has called you to speak out for him. What do we tell him? You tell others the night and day difference that God has made for you. Look, at, look don't tell people how they need to change. Look, that's, don't do that. Don't step into that. You just tell about what God did for you. You have a story to tell, and that's what God has called you and if they go, well, what about that Noah? What about Noah? And how do you fit all those, those animals in the boat and stuff? I don't know, but, but can I tell you the night and day difference that God, what about Jonah? How in the world did that fish? You know, three days, no oxygen, come on. Well, I don't know about all that. But can I tell you of what Jesus did for me? For, he took me from nothing to something. He took me from rejected to accepted. And honestly, this is probably all you need right here to, to know what God has called us to share. This, you probably wouldn't need any more message than 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. Because God has called you not to share the Bible. God has called you to share Jesus. Are you hearing me okay? Did you know the first apostles, like the apostles, the disciples, they didn't have the Bible to share. They weren't trying to convince people of the Bible that the Bible was real. Look, some of you are fighting the wrong battles. You're trying to convince people of the wrong things. Yes, the Bible is the word of God. But that when the disciples were empowered and Jesus said, come on, come on, come follow me. I'm going to make you fishers of men. And when he gave them this assignment to go make disciples, they didn't go out there and try to convince people that Noah, how many, or that Jonah, or that the Old Testament, or that the Torah. They were trying to convince people that they knew a man named Jesus who claimed to be God and who made this audacious claim that he would die and three days later would be raised from the dead. That is what they preached. That is their message, was that this Jesus that they knew, that he bore witness to, changed their life and started a movement. Can I get an amen, somebody? That's who you're to share. You're to share Jesus, not convince people of the Bible. Okay? So here, let me help you uh, become, to take John's mission. It's ours. Hey, you lovers of Jesus, it's ours. This John's mission is now our missions. We are his witness. We are his his missionaries to this world. So write these down. Take some notes, you guys. Number one, we are called to share the hope that we have. We are called to share the hope that we have. So I made a decision to follow Christ, and let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. Well, Jason, what, what about the Old Testament? What about, no, no, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. But like, can I tell you uh, uh, why I chose to follow Jesus? That's what we're to share, the hope that we have. First Peter chapter 3 says this, but in your hearts. So you really can't share anything unless you decided something. You made a decision in your heart to revere Christ as Lord. Always, he says, be prepared to give an answer. That word there is defense. You know why? You're you're prepared. You need to be prepared to give an answer because everyone's going to ask you to give a reason for the hope that you have. Why in the world do you, do you love the way you love? Why do you have so much peace? Why do you, have, why do you forgive people? Why are you so free? What is, what is it about you? We need prepared to give an answer for the hope that we have, the Bible says. And literally, this is the plan right here for us to, for us to um, share the gospel. And it goes on. It says, but do this. Don't try to convince people. Don't try to win an argument. You're trying to win hearts. You're not trying to win a debate. It's not about a debate. It's not about what's right and wrong. You're trying to win, not the argument, trying to win a heart. So do this, he says, with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed about their slander. I'm telling you, this is, I, would, I want this so much for you guys because there is there's almost nothing better, honestly, almost nothing better in this life that we could experience than playing a role in somebody making a decision to make Jesus their Lord, that their eternal, their eternal destiny is, is, is made. And there's, there's almost just nothing better of being a part of someone making that decision. And I want this for you, you guys. Like the, my favorite part of the service on Sundays 
here at Discovery is when I say every head bow, I close. Every Sunday is my favorite part. And I get a vantage point that a lot of you don't get because you don't peek. I know you don't peek. <laughs> I see you, okay? But when I, when I say and I, and I get to see the, the decisions being made and the hands and the tears and, and I, get to, like, I get to see you. And some of you, a lot of you here made that, de- made that decision right here at Discovery. It, I'm telling you, there is, there is n- almost nothing greater and I want that for you. So you need to know how to share your story. You need to know how to share your story. And I'm going to give you three elements of your story. And my goal is just to show you how simple it is. The first is, first, take some notes. First is, how, let me tell you how I realized that I actually needed Christ, that I had a need. And if you've been around here at Discovery, you probably heard um, my testimony ad nauseum. I have multiple testimonies, but I was in a, I was in a place where I had tried everything. I was trying to, I was looking for, for fulfillment, for satisfaction in all things of life. So I tried drug to the next drug to the next drug or this relationship, that relationship. I tried success and money. I started playing semi-professional football. Oh, I tr- just kept trying things to fulfill and satisfy the need that I had in my soul and my heart and nothing did. Everything just left me even more empty because I thought it would be the thing, the fix. It would, it would do it for me and nothing did. I would be sitting with my friends at a party having what used to be a good time and I couldn't even fake it anymore. I couldn't smile, couldn't laugh, I couldn't even put on anymore. It was just, it was so empty. I was so depressed with life. What is this life? That was the condition. And the next step is this, how I committed of our story, how I committed my life to Christ. So it was in that condition, for me, in that condition, empty, depressed, lifeless, purposeless, that I kept getting invited to a church by a young girl named Veronica. (laughs) She kept inviting me to a church, and I decided to go so I wouldn't be called a liar, because I told her I would go, you know, but I honestly thought, like, why not? Let me try this out. You know, I've tried everything else, and I went during a, a time where they're having an old-time revival, okay? And so they had an evangelist there that was like, it, he was just preaching a simple gospel message about Jesus Christ. And I just, as he was speaking the word, it, it filled a part of my soul that nothing else touched. It, it filled an emptiness, and I knew, I knew in my heart that this this was what I was missing, and it changed my life forever. So the next part of your story is the difference now that it is made that decision has made in your life. And I'm not perfect, and I still miss it sometimes, but what I do have is purpose. I have life. I have fulfillment, and I have hope, you guys. Where I didn't have hope, I have hope now. Jesus never promised that we would have perfect, no tough times and no tough days, because I've had some really tough times. I've experienced some really hard days, but but in the midst of it, let me tell you what I do have. I do know that God is God. He's in control. And one glad morning when this life is over, I'm going to be with Jesus in eternity in heaven. Can I get an amen, church? I have a hope that I didn't used to have. I have, I have an eternity that I didn't used to have at all. And so when I, honestly, when I share Christ with people, I don't share the Bible. I don't try to convince people of the Bible. I share the hope. I share the hope. I explain people the hope that they can have that I have. I went and visited a a lady by the name of Kathy some years ago. Her husband was dying, like on his deathbed, and all of her family, his family was there. And he was a devout follower of Jesus, but she was never a follower of Jesus. She would go to church sometimes, but never really a faith. And she knew, and she even said, she's there broken, and family is broken, because many of them didn't know Jesus the way that he knew Jesus. And and I'm asking her about her life, and and, and why why is she so broken? You know where he's going? She said, because I don't know if I'm going there. And I said, you know what? You know why you're hurting so bad right now? Is because you know you'll never see him again. I said, what's what's even worse, Kathy, is that I'll see him again and you never will. And she said, said, well, Pastor, how do you get that hope? Like she literally said, how do you get that hope? She teed it up for me, man. If you can't hit that ball, you can't play, okay? (laughs) It was just like, come on. And so I ministered to her, that whole family, and they gave their life to Jesus, and she's been serving God. Her family's been serving God. She has a hope, you guys, and it's the difference that Jesus makes. Here's the second thing that we need to do. Not only share your story, but we need to share my church. Share my church because we have designed our church discovery around people who are far from God. Let me just pause and take a time out right now and just 
say something that I try to say several times a year here at Discovery or more. I, I say it in our membership class, and I want to kind of reiterate and share it again today that this is a big deal to God. This is a big deal to our, our church, and that is that when we started Discovery five years ago, we never designed or desired to start a church for church, pre, for church people. We, we didn't start a church for church people. Now, I, I hope that this church is a blessing to you. And there's a lot of things that are for you at this church. Like we do, we hope we minister to your kids, I hope, and your youth and your students. And we have things that are for you, like, like Brave coming up and men's stuff that are just for you. And honestly, small groups are just for you, for you to build relationships, for you to get connected, for you to grow deeper in your walk with Christ. Like it is all about you. But we made a decision five years ago that we would create services that believers and people far away from God would love to attend and enjoy. That's, that we would, make, we, would make, we would make them feel welcomed, that we wouldn't talk down to them, that they wouldn't feel pressured, and we'd give them coffee and donuts and lots of Jesus. Amen? Amen. We're a place where lost people aren't asked for anything. They don't need to give. They don't need to serve. They, just, they can just come and simply check it out and see if this faith thing, this Christianity thing, this, this Jesus thing is right for them. Now look in my eyes. Listen to me. That will always stay the mission and the priority of this church. No matter how long we are in existence, no matter how large we grow, because this is a big deal to God. And that's where some people go, oh, pastor, oh, that church is too big now. Huh? Man, I, I wish it was small again. And, and that's, do you know, that's like saying that hospital over there is just too big. They're helping too many people over there. What's the matter with them? You guys, it, the church has to get big because the need is big. This is a big deal to God. Amen, Jesus lovers? And I'm not talking about just our church. I'm talking about every church. Like, this is God's heart. The church needs to be about this mission that he's called us to fulfill. And then not just here, every church, which is why. I just met with our leadership team and our board of trustees, and we've, we, we are partnering with an, with an organization that I'm, I'm on the leadership team of called Church Boom, Church Boom, and what we're doing is, is we're giving 1% of our, of our tithes and offering. For those that don't know, 10% of all the tithes and offering goes to local and global missions here at Discovery. So you give to a lot of stuff you don't even know you're giving to, but we're giving, ten, we tithe it off the top to local and global missions, and 1% of our giving together will go towards um, churches that are hurting, dying, um, so that they can see life and growth. Amen, you guys? You guys, there's a problem in our country right now. Two-thirds of churches are either declined or dying. There's, there are thousands of churches every year that are closing their doors, and God has blessed us. He has blessed us with, with uh, systems and strategies and a leadership and the way that we do things that facilitates health and growth. And so there's going to be a, a large part of my time in this next season. I'm thankful that, that we have a team around me that's allowing me to do this, but there's a portion of my time that I'm going to be given to coach pastors to become better leaders and to raise the attendance in this, and, and, and the, uh, the ability of churches to reach their communities, uh, the lost people that are in their communities. Can I get an amen, you guys? Yeah. Amen. Because this is a big, because, because God so loved the world, you guys. Jesus said it this way in Luke chapter 14. He said, go out into the country and urge anyone you find to come in so that my house will be what? Full. Will be full. God likes it that way. I know you don't like it that way. I mean, I don't like it that way. You sit down and go, oh, they're sitting next to me. I need some room here, man. Is there some, I mean, the parking, come on. Why are all these cars? I got to park over here. I know you don't like it, but God looks at it and he goes, I love it. Pack them in, pack them in, fill it up, fill it up. I want it full. That's God's heart to reach the lost and the hurting and the broken. God wants his house full. That's why we knocked down this wall right here some, some while ago. If you guys don't know, there was a wall right here. We knocked it down, expanded our worship center. Why? Because there's lost and hurting people that need the hope. They need this hope that we have. And we've been called to give him this hope. So how, what do we need to do to share our church? Here's what I'm asking you to do. Number one, I want you to pray for them. Like, pray for those who need the hope. Pray for the lost people by name, the people in your sphere, the people in others' sphere. What I want you to do here for the next week, I'm going to ask you, church, lovers of God, can you pray for next Sunday? It's Easter Sunday. He is risen. Amen. He is alive. This Sunday is a huge Sunday, all right? Pray, will you help me pray that 
the blinders. Second Corinthians, it's not in your notes, but Second Corinthians chapter four, verse four says that the enemy, the devil, the little G God, has blinded the minds of those who do not believe. That there's blinders on people. They're walking around and what the, the, different things are blinding them. It's their pain. It's their past. It's their hurts. It's their, it's their issues. It's their addiction. It's whatever it is. It's, it's, bl- it's religion. It's just things are blinding them. Will you help me pray that God will lift the blinders, remove the blinders? That 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 says that they would see the light of the gospel and the glory of Christ. Can I get an amen, you guys? Will you help me pray for lost people this Sunday? So many people are going to come. We're going to pray for them. Number two. We're going to show them that we care, and that's what you need to do in order to share uh, your church. Show that we want to show them we care. Like I love, and I love. That's why we invest in our dream centers, and and we invest into helping people. Why? Because people don't care what you know until they know that you care. All right. So what are what are people looking for in your life, in our community, not in your notes? They're looking for three things. Okay. They want to know: Can you help me? Like, I don't care about your church. I really don't care about your church. I don't care about your God. Can you help me? Because can you help me with my marriage? Can you help me with my finances? Can you help me with this stronghold, this addiction in my life? Which is, there's so many small groups for this, like for helping people. We, We launched a freedom night that is just for helping people with grief, with addiction, with marriage. There was someone in our church that invited somebody who's never been to a Christian church at all just a few months ago. They said, hey, they know they needed freedom in an area of their life because they opened up to her. And they said, hey, come on Wednesday to our freedom night. She said, oh, do I need to go to the church? You don't need to go to the church. You don't need anything. We want to help you. She showed up a couple months ago to our freedom night and gave her life to Jesus, never stepped foot inside our church. Why? Because we just want to help you. Amen, somebody. You can give God praise for that. There's so many small groups, honestly, that are just geared towards helping people. Like you could do a parenting group. Oh, you want to help with your kids? You can go to your coworkers or unchurch people and say, hey, I'll help you with your kids. Or success or leadership. There's so, many, there's so many things that we have, curriculum that we have that we can give you just to help people. Here's, here's the second thing I want to know. They want to know, do you care about me? Like who am I to you? Do you even care? Do you know my name? Do you care about me? And number three, they want to know, can I trust you? Are you trustworthy? And it may take a lot of time for you to develop this with people, like all three of these, but it's worth it, man. I'm telling you, it's worth it to be a part of someone making a decision in, 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 in their eternity in heaven forever. Amen? Amen. Here's the, the next point there in sharing your church. We want you to invite them and to, to join me, like join me at a service. So don't just invite them and say, come to one of our services. Say, hey, which one's best for you? And I'll go to the one that you want to go to, and I'll sit right next to you. I'm telling you guys, this, it is statistic, like this is statistically true, that people are four times more likely to say yes to your invitation, to invite them to your church this Sunday than any other Sunday, on Easter Sunday, than any other Sunday of the year. Like they're, they're just ready for the hope that you have. And all we need to do is just invite them. They are four times more likely to say yes, and I'm telling you, when you invite someone to come with you, to join you, and to sit with you, and when they have a life-changing experience with Jesus, and you get to be a part of that, that will be one of the most memorable services of your life, and it will have nothing to do about the message. It'll have nothing to do about you or how you thought about it. It'll be about you being used by God in someone else's life and their eternal destination. Now, the bad news about this church is that we're living in a post-Christian America now. That's what they say. That, and, and the ologists that study this, I don't know what kind of ologists study this, but there's an, some ologists that study this kind of, and they say there are 11 different Americas. And California on this side of the coast is one of the worst post-Christian Americas that there is. And what, they, what they're saying is that 80% of the people who don't know Jesus or don't go to church will not believe in Jesus or go to church. They won't. At least that's what they say. Unless somebody one-on-one tells them that's the world we're li- so so i need i need to teach you this this third part of being a missionary because because you need you need just enough information to be dangerous okay all right you, got, you need just enough so here it is there's number three in order to be john's mission your mission we have to be able to share christ and people have made this so hard I'm going to simplify it for you because there's really just two things, a part of this gospel message that God has called us to share. And the first is this, God loves you. Come on, say it with me. One, two, three, God loves you. John 3, 16, 
God, man, look, it doesn't matter what you've done or what you've experienced or how bad or far. Oh, if I go into there, the church will just burn down. No, 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 you don't know how much God loves you. He's been waiting for you. God so loved the whole world that he even gave his one and only son, like his only child he gave for you, that you wouldn't perish but have eternal life. That you would have eternal life. Well, what about that Noah? I don't know. What about that? What about that part of the Bible that I don't know about all that? Okay? But I do know that God loves you. He loves you. Let me tell you why this is important, you guys. Because every person, no matter if they claim to be an atheist or agnostic or whatever, every person was made in the image of God and has something inside of them that's trying to get home. Every person was like, it's like a little, it's like a homing beacon. It might be smaller in some people, larger in others, but every person has this homing beacon inside of them that's trying to reconnect with their creator, reconnect with the God that loves them and created them. Every person is made in the image of God and has that inside of them. They need to know that God loves them. One of my favorite stories, one of my favorite discovery stories in the five years that we've um, there are so many of them, but one of my favorite is, is of Noah. He, when we launched Discovery Church, we sent out mailer, mailers, these big mailers to the community around, and one of the guys that got it was Noah. Some of you that have been here for a while know Noah. He's moved, um, watches still on, on YouTube. He watches still, but he's moved away from Bakersfield. But he came, and he was a, to Discovery. He was an atheist, and something was going on in his life. He was just getting divorced, and some other tragedies and things were happening. He said, eh, why not? Let me go try this out. But didn't like church, didn't like religion, was more an atheist. And so he came and one week and launch week, came again the next week and he waited for me out in the front. And I went out there as I usually do and talking to people. He waited for me patiently and I got to know us, shook his hand. He said, hey, pastor, I just, you know, got your flyer. It came last week, came today and I really like it, he said, but I, I, I need to tell you that I'm, I'm an atheist. I just, I don't, I don't believe in Jesus. I don't, I don't believe in all, but I do like what you're sharing, and I feel good about what you're sharing. And I said, I told Noah, I said, hey, there's a reason why you feel good, and I want you to know, you don't have to believe before you belong here. Like this church, I told him, this church was made for you. You feel comfortable, and you keep coming. If it's good for you, good for your life, you keep coming. But Noah, why do you, why do you feel the need to tell me this. Why? And he said, he said, because I just felt bad that, you know, here I am not, not even believing. I'm an atheist. And I'm, and I'm in your church. And I just, I don't know if I, if I can be here. And I said, no, man, you can be here. You actually belong here. I want you here. Every, every week, every week, I, you just come and, and let God speak to you and let his word, let it encourage you. And you know what? I, I want you to know, I told him, God loves you. And the reason why your life is, is, is kind of messed up right now is because John 10 10 says the thief has come to still kill and destroy that's what's happening in your life he's he's beating you up but you know what Jesus has come to give you not just save your life but to give you a better life to give you life and you to experience it to the full so here's the second part not only God loves you but God has an incredible plan for your life Noah he's got such a great plan for your life you just keep coming man and if at any time that you want this relationship and choose faith you just, at the time when I say bow heads and close eyes like I've been doing, no, I want you to look up at me and give me a wave. Know that there's no pressure. No one's going to twist your arms. No one's going to force you to do anything. You just come and be encouraged. It didn't take but a month later, four weeks later, when I got to that message, bow your heads and close your eyes. And I told people to lift up their hand. I see no in the back. He's sitting back. <laughs> Why? Because everybody knows that, that they were created for more. And God has called us to share Christ, you guys. God loves you and has an incredible purpose for your life. And most people don't experience that. Most people can't experience God's love and incredible purpose. So let me give you three parts, the three parts of the gospel, okay? It starts like this. It starts with what I call the problem, okay? And, and, and the problem is that people don't experience God's love and don't have his incredible purpose plan because there's something in the way. There's a blockade. There's something in that blockade is sin. Sin separates. There is, there's, there's this big separation between us and God. There's this big ditch. There's this big chasm that we cannot bridge because the Bible says that every single one of us has sinned and fallen short of the glory. And sin is just, the word sin is an archery term that means to miss the mark. And every one of us miss the mark in a lot of different ways. Every one, all have sinned and fallen short of the glorious standard 
of God. Every one of us have, and that can't even be in God's presence. So we got to deal with the sin issue. And the question is, how then do you deal with the sin issue? How do we deal with being separated from God? And here's the answer. You got to pay for it. Well, what's the payment? You got to die. For the wages of sin is death. Well, that doesn't sound very good. You know, that's a catch-22, isn't it? Because I want to I wanna be with God, and I want to get right with God, but, but if I got to die, I'm not going to be with God. Well, that's because, that's, you're right. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And that is, write it down, that's the second part of the gospel story. That's the solution to our sin problem. See, the only reason why people are separated in the first place is because of sin. That is the problem. But the solution, Romans chapter 5, verse 8, says that God demonstrated his own love. He didn't wait for you to love him. He didn't wait for you to do anything. God took the first step toward us. He demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were still missing the mark, while we were still going the wrong direction, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He stepped in and said, I'll pay your bill, which is great news because you don't have to pay it anymore, which by the way, no religion in the entire world offers this. No, no religion in the entire world even offers a solution to the very problem that we have. But Jesus steps in and says, I will pay your debt. I will pay your bill. Well, are you sure about that? Yeah, look what the Bible says in John 14. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. But why Jesus? Because he's the only one that didn't have to pay his own bill. Because he was perfect. Can I get an amen, church? He was perfect. And that's why Acts 4.12 says, salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. And I love this. And I want you to understand the basics of the gospel. If you ever get in a discussion um, about Jesus or the Bible, oh, I don't know about that. I'm sorry. I didn't watch the Da Vinci Code. I'm sorry. I, I, can't, I can't answer your questions about the Da Vinci Code, but I do know this. God loves you. God loves you, and he has an incredible, oh, I'm sorry, I don't know about Noah and how that actually worked or the Jonah thing or the, or, or the miracle thing that you have of trouble, but I do, I do know this. I do know that God loves you, and he has an incredible plan for your life. Well, what do I do about that? Well, I hate to tell you, there's a problem. Sin's the problem. Well, how do I deal with that? Well, you got to pay for it. Well, then what's the payment? You got to die. Well, that doesn't sound good. Yeah, that's why Jesus came in, and he died for you. He paid your bill. Well, then what's the next part of the gospel story? I'm going to give it to you, but I'm going to give you the, verse, the verses first because I know when I give you the last feeling, you start clicking your notebook. So here they are. <laughs> Here's the next verse. Revelation says. He's, oh no, is that it? No, First John. Sorry, John chapter 1, verse 12. But to all who believed him and accepted him. Isn't that so simple, man? That's it. To all who believed and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. And what does that believing and accepting look like? I, I, I probably quote this every, every Sunday, Romans chapter 10, that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus, you're my Lord. That means lordship, controller, owner, I guess surrender. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's with your heart that you believe and you're cleansed, just as you've never, you're justified. All the wrongs, all, the, all that sin that separated you is justified. And it is with your mouth that you have confessed and you are saved. Now, let me tell you a story before I give you this next scripture. One of my, probably the favorite story of discovery I, I have, and there's so many, but is the story of, of John. John, um, and some of you know John, he's still connected to discovery. Um, John grew up in a very, uh, in a church atmosphere, a religious atmosphere. His, his parents went to a church that was very religious, very legalistic. It was a lot of pointing fingers and, and, and hell talk, and, and it was just a, 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 just a different environment. And he obviously didn't like church and didn't want to go to church. And even the parents didn't like church, and they just became, you know, um, Christer Christians. You know what I'm saying? They came on Chris, Christmas and Easter. They were Christers. So, you know, a lot of Christers probably. So that's what they became, you know. But they knew God, but they just didn't like church. So... So John just, when he gave him of age where he can argue good enough, he just stopped, he just argued his way out of, out of church. And so he just really didn't believe and develop a faith because of it. And then we started discovering his mom and dad, um, uh, Christy and, and Fabian Highfield, a lot of you know them, Christy and Fabian Highfield started coming to discovery and just 
Start, their faith just started reigniting and God lit a fire under them again. They started loving Jesus more and wanting to serve God and, 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 just, and just God just changed their life. And John was looking on going, wow, mom and dad are so much different. Dad never even had his own faith and now he does. And, and so he started coming to Discovery as well. And, and just like kind of Noah, he came for a little bit and he, he, he made an appointment with me, filled out a card, made an appointment with me. I, I met with him in my office that used to be the nursery. I was just in a folding table. It was where we were. Just so come on in, John. And, and John starts telling me that, that, um, that he's enjoying it. He's glad the difference that, that it's making in his parents' life. Um, but he, he, he doesn't really like church or Christians. Um, never, really, never really, you know, doesn't even know about Jesus. And, but really likes the services. And, uh, and he's really driven. He said, I'm really driven. I want to I be a great leader, and I want to be successful. I want to make money, be a good leader, and be successful. That's what I want to do. I'm a business major. I'm doing this. And, and there's, I, what you're saying is so good for me. Like I, it's stuff that I can apply to be a better leader and, and, and be more successful in life. And I, just, and I, said, and I told John, John, why are you telling me, a pastor, of this, though? And he said, because I just, I just felt, I felt a little bad. I felt like you should, you should know. I said, John, I want to tell you something that, that I know that God loves you. And I know he's, he's messing with you, John. I can tell. That, and actually, Revelation says this. It says that Jesus, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. The Jason International Version is, God will mess with you. <laughs> <laughs> just messing with you. And I said, hey, he's, I, I can tell. Just like he's messing with some of you right now. Like God is messing with some of you right now. And he's, he's messing with you, telling you something like, Hey, isn't it about time you stop running? Hey, isn't it about time? Come on. I know you hear my voice. I know you hear, I know you've been, you know you've been made for more. You know, but isn't it time for you to come home? Isn't it time? And he will mess with you and keep messing with you. And I told him, John, I can tell God is messing with you. And I know you know, you have it in you. I know it was a religious environment and stuff, but I know you know God loves you and has an incredible plan for your life. And I want you to know you can come and just hear and be encouraged. And I know God's word will apply to your business, will apply to your leadership, will apply. It's going to make you more successful, John. You just come. Just know you belong here, man. You're going to be loved. And don't even worry about it. But if there are ever a time where you want to accept God's love and his plan for your life, when I get to that, I told him like I told him, when I get to that part of the service, I just tell people to close their eyes, put their hands down. I want you to look at me, man. And I'd love to celebrate with you when that happens. But just know, I am not pushing you. No one's going to push you here but you belong, man. So it was just a few weeks later, in the service, all eyes are closed, and John over in the corner somewhere, and when you lift up your hands, and, and John, looked at, he looked at me with two hands like this, you know, and just like, like I'm in, man. I had the pleasure of just three weeks after that moment baptizing John, and then he went to our ministry school. I credentialed him as a pastor. He's a youth pastor at Discovery Church in Camarillo right now. Can I get some praise? Come on, somebody. Praise Jesus. So what is it? What's the, the, there's the problem, there's, there's the solution, but there is, lastly, there's a response that we, need to, that we need to make. Just like John did and Noah did and so many thousands of people have done over the years of discovery. And what's that response? Give him your life. He gave his life for you. And he, he's asked us to give our life to him. And in doing that, we would truly know life and have it to the full. Come on, let's bow our heads right now and close our eyes.